walk up. I'll take him when you're ready to walk up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he's going to give it to Just not verbal. Yeah, so we can hear it. Good evening to our Berean Church family and anyone else who might be watching us on the internet tonight. We're glad to bring you this service and we're so thankful that you've joined us uh, through the medium of the internet. Uh, this is our normal midweek uh, service here at Berean and in a moment our assistant pastor, Brother Aaron, will be bringing the Bible lesson. For those, though, who might be watching for the first time, I always take this opportunity to give you a little bit of info about uh, Berean Baptist Church. We're an old-fashioned, independent, fundamental Baptist church. We sing the old hymns from the hymn book. We preach and teach from the old King James Bible, which we here believe that it is the true preserved word of the living God uh, there. Our services are warm and spiritual. And if you still believe in the old past, you still believe in the old way, you still believe in doing things the right way, the way God would have it to be done, uh, we would invite you to visit us when this pandemic is over. Uh, we're located at 17377 Godwin Avenue here in Port Charlotte. If you'd like more information sometime to find out more about our church, uh, call 941-421-421. Uh, Two two one seven. <clears throat> now, let me remind everyone who is listening in, especially our church family, we will be broadcasting our regular Sunday uh, services, Sunday morning, uh, the Bible study. Brother Aaron will have the Bible study at uh, 930. The morning preaching hour will begin at 1030, and then we will have an evening service again at 6 p.m. I also... Feel, uh, feel led to keep reminding those who wish to do so, and we hope and pray you will do so, is to send your tithes and your offerings, and especially your mission giving. Uh, we have heard from some of our missionaries, and they are beginning to really feel this pandemic. They're, it's really affecting them. Some of them are, are just going to have to squeeze by. So please, if you will, uh, send it to my uh, address, uh, that's for security reasons, 20357 Peaceland Boulevard, Port Charlotte, uh, and uh, 33954. And tr you pray about it, but the uh, church goes on. Whether we've got a five or 500, uh, we've got to carry on the work. And also, tonight, continue to pray, if you will, for Brother Don Moore and Sister Pat. I talked to Don just a few moments ago, and he's re, uh, recovering, but it's slow, and it's, it's, he's in considerable pain uh, there. So uh, please uh, remember them in prayer. Basically, most of our people are doing well. I talk to two or three of them every day, try to keep in contact uh, as I can uh, on it. And uh, everyone seems to have upbeat. Everyone's praying that soon we'll get through this and get back to a normal routine. In the meantime, we'll do the best we can, follow our president's orders as close as we can. But remember to pray this prayer. Pray for our president. Pray for our nation. Pray for our church. And pray for each and ever believer, uh, and especially our brothers and sisters here at Berean. And pray for me and Betty, if you will, uh, there. Yeah. So now I'll just invite you to sit back, grab a Bible. Maybe you're in your living room or your study or whatever it might be. A lot of folk have let us know they're listening in, and we appreciate that. So Brother Aaron will come and share God's word with us and you just enjoy the Bible lesson tonight. Brother Aaron, come on if you will, and God bless you.
Okay, turn in your Bibles to Lamentations chapter number 3. Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter number 3. We're going to read two verses, pray, and then I'm going to begin the lesson tonight. Lamentations chapter number 3, verse number 57. The Bible reads, Thou drawest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou saidest, Fear not. O Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that it would be your words tonight, that your Holy Spirit would use me, and that it would edify and strengthen our church that are not able to join together tonight, that you would encourage them, strengthen them, lift them up, pick them up. Lord, I ask that those in attendance tonight who are not members of our church but fellow believers, that they would be able to benefit from the teaching as well that the Holy Spirit would move in their heart and, and in their life. Lord, and if there be somebody out there that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Lord, that this would be the day, the time, the appointed hour, whether it be day or night, whether they be in the United States or clear across the world. Lord, I just ask that you would move and touch your people with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I feel like many of us are having a feeling of despair. Many of us feel abandoned. Some of us feel that uh, God's with us, and some of us feel like he's forsaken us. Um, I'm going to tell a, um, a quick little story before I begin tonight. This was the uh, message I was going to preach on Sunday morning if Pastor um, was not able to make it back after tending to Miss Betty, and I'm glad she was okay. I'm glad everything turned out okay. I, I personally think she just wanted attention. She wanted Pastor to come home and, and, be, and be the Lone Ranger, the knight in shining armor, whatever. Um, what a couple, what a couple. Um, but we went to Wal Walgreens the other day, my wife and I. Um, we were sending money to some Filipino uh, missionary slash national missionaries that we support as a Sunday school because they needed, they needed to buy food. And I, I know in America we complain because we have to wait an hour or two in line depending on where you're at in America. Or, you know, you may go into the store and maybe they don't have ground beef this time. Maybe you have to buy chicken. Um, but they have to actually struggle just for the funds at this time to be able to go in to the marketplace to buy the food and basic supplies that we take for granted. We, we may have a shortage of toilet paper, but there are other things we can buy to replace that. Imagine what it would be like to not even have the money to go in in the event that you may be lucky enough to find it. That's the situation they were in or they are in even at this very moment. Um, as I, as I was sitting at, I guess it's called a kiosk, um, and I was typing in the different information for each individual pastor that we were trying to help, um, <clears throat> my wife would then go up and pay at the register. At that time, I heard something behind me and I turned and there was a lady probably mid to late sixties and she had, uh, one of the masks on. And the thing that struck me was the fact that her eyes were just bugging out of her head. She looked like she had no hope. She looked distressed. She looked like she had despair, worry. And I just, I just noticed her eyes because I couldn't see any other part. And as I looked at her eyes, I just, I said, you know, ma'am, I'm sorry. I'm only going to be a few more minutes. You, you may need to send money to somebody as well. And I apologize. And she said, no, 
No, I, I, I just, I'm really, really scared and I'm really nervous and I, I need to help my family, but, but take your time. It's, it's no big deal. And, and at that time, I, I proceeded to tell her what we were doing, my wife and I, and how we were um, trying to um, support missionaries from around um, over in the Philippines. And at that time, she, she said, well, okay, so, so what, what exactly is it that you're doing? And I went on to tell her that I was the assistant pastor and uh, um, that, you know, we, we preach and we teach. And um, at that time, Brother Jan, there's somebody at the door. Um, <clears throat> at that time, she, uh, she, she began to say how scared she was as I was beginning to tell her that um, what we did and, and how we rely on the Lord to meet our needs and how we take care of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And she continued to explain at that time that she was scared to death, that she had never seen anything like this happen in the United States since she's been here. And at that time, um, she proceeded to be very fearful and then um, I told her we'd love for her to come and visit, and this is where we're at, and we're online as well. Now, what I started to think about as I left was, is this really what America's become? A nation that's afraid, afraid to stand strong? Every, every generation in this nation has had to answer the call one way or another, whether it was to fight in the Revolutionary War, whether it was World War I, whether it was your parents who are no longer with us today that had to answer the call in World War II, or whether you're a Korean veteran, a Vietnam veteran, or an Iraqi veteran, or whether you've gone through different presidential cycles where the economy hasn't done well. Every generation has had to answer a call. But the problem is this generation has become afraid. I've never seen more fear in the eyes of the American people than I have now. It seems like everybody's looking for answers and nobody has them. But this is no new thing under the sun according to the word of God. We're going to begin our study tonight because I want you to know tonight that as a Christian, this is not who we are. We should not be fearful. We are to fear not. I don't know. Maybe I'm naive. Maybe I don't watch enough television to get scared. Maybe I don't listen to the news enough to become fearful. I don't know. But what I do know is I'm saved, and I have a home in heaven, and I have nothing to fear. Amen. And I'll tell you right now, as a saved Christian tonight, you have nothing to fear if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But just because you're saved doesn't mean you are not going to get afraid. So if you will, look at cha uh, chapter number 3, verse number 22. Verse... Well, let me start back at verse number 19, because this is the prophet Jeremiah. That's who penned this book. And in verse 19, the Bible says, remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great, great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them, unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of of the Lord. And something that I was always taught about the word hope is the hap hope means the happy anticipation of good. And if we wait for the Lord, he's going to give us something good. You know, <clears throat> my hope brother Jan um singing the song, I'm not going to butcher a song, but there's a song that came to my mind 
Um, when I think about hope, the, uh, the song, is, I, I forget the title of it, but the words go, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. See, my hope is in Jesus tonight. My hope is in the Lord. I know that my soul, I know that sometimes I could be brought down and I can get discouraged. I can get depressed. I can have despair on my face as well. I can worry, but I'm not going to stay there because I know the Lord, according to this word of God, he, I'm going to wait for him because my soul seeketh him and I know that he's going to come to my aid. Whether it's a physical aid, a financial aid, the healing of my family. I know the Lord is not going to forsake me. I know he's going to meet with me because the Bible is where we get that proof tonight. So I hope I don't mess up Brother Jan. I did, I did pen this before, uh, before we talked earlier, but um, turn in your Bible, keep in your place in Lamentations chapter number three. Turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter number one. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. We were kind of talking about how each one of us could preach using the same verses, different sermons. So hopefully I haven't stepped on his toes too much. I'm going to skip down just for the sake of time starting in number th- verse number 3 of chapter 1. As I put, besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went unto Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which, mi- which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, and out of a good conscience and of faith, Unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. For the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for, se- for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other such thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Listen, my hope isn't in the law. My hope is in Jesus Christ the end of the law for righteousness. My faith is unfeigned in verse number five. I'm not faking my faith tonight. And I'm asking each one of you to get your faith back, to put your faith back where it belongs. We don't have to watch the TV all day, do we? We don't have to watch the banter back and forth. You know, some of these things can just have us work ourselves into a mental frenzy. Instead of doing that, we need to pick up our Bible and go to the one who can give us hope and give us comfort. We don't need to, we don't need to argue over every little thing. We don't need to dispute who thinks this is worse than that or this time in history is different than that time in history. Every one of us at this time is here for a reason. God has saw it fit that I be here in America at this time, just as he saw it fit that each one of you would be here during this crisis. He's chosen you to be here. Because God could take each one of us out at any time. But yet he's allowed each one of us to be alive at this time for a reason. And what we do is going to determine, what we do is going to determine the outcome of our nation Because if we get afraid and we draw in and we quit giving out the gospel and we quit telling our friends about Jesus and we quit fighting uh, the good fight, so to speak, and we just give up and give in and hide in our rooms and just shut our blinds and don't let the world come in, then they've won. They've won. They've accomplished what they've set out to do. And that's to keep us 
afraid. You know, <clears throat> the Bible's very deep, and I can run off on a lot of these different verses here and probably preach a totally different sermon. But I want you to understand something tonight. <clears throat> the law was not made for a righteous man. It was made to show us that we need a Savior, right? That's the first and foremost important thing tonight. We need to make sure that we're saved. And if you're not saved, tonight would be a great night to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight would be the kind of night where you could get down on your knees and you could cry out to Jesus and ask him to come in and save you. And he would. Verse 11 says it's a glorious gospel. And it is. What it's like to have guilt removed in your life. Oh, what a Savior Jesus is, isn't he? What a Savior. And to the Christian who has guilt, he's also the forgiver if you're saved. The Bible says he'll forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, that's kind of my cry tonight is that we can, look, we can listen to Pastor and Brother Jan and we can hear seven, uh, Second Chronicles 7.14 and we can say, well, that's a great verse and that means a lot to me and then we can go on out the door, nothing changes. Or tonight's the night that you can get down on your knees and you can pray. You can trust Jesus as your Savior or you can ask him to clean you up a little bit. And you know, if every one of us was true and right with ourselves, we all need a little cleaning up, don't we? I know I do, every day. Turn back to Lamentations chapter 3 if you held your place there. Why? Because the Lord's... The Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, they are new in verse 23 every morning if you're saved. Every morning you get another dose of mercy. Every morning. Every morning the Lord can pick you up. Can pick you up. So my call tonight is if you're not saved, come to the Lord tonight and get saved. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing. 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 By the word of God. Let's go down to verse 31. Part of my lesson tonight is if you are saved, let's get right. Let's get it right. Verse 31, for the Lord will not cast off forever. Hmm. Sounds like something King David said. He's never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. That doesn't mean you're always going to have your belly filled, but God's going to meet your need. We also know that the Bible says he will never forsake us in the book of Hebrews as well. I think it's chapter number 13. For the Lord will not cast off forever unsaved person, but though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. I don't believe... That what's going on today is caused by God. I don't believe this is something that God has sent to get us. I really don't. I've looked in the Bible. I've studied it going over pestilence and different things. And I'm just not dead set yet that this is from God. But make no mistake, God's allowing it to happen. He is allowing it to happen. Why? Because he'll have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth. He's not trying to crush everybody. He's trying to get you to come to him. To turn aside the right man before the face of the Most High. To subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. What did I just read out of 1 Timothy? The law is not for a righteous man. But for sinners, that's what the Bible says. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not? Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. Wherefore doth a living man complain, and a man for the punishment 
of his sins. There's a question mark. We shouldn't complain right now. This should be a time that we can turn off the television, go sit on our back porch. We live in the greatest state, if you're here in Florida with us, in the whole world. You can sit outside. Yeah, Michigan, I know, Brother Jam, but there's nothing good up there, not even the Wolverines. (laughs) I'm from Ohio originally, so I'm a Buckeye. Um, Listen, we can sit on our back porch and there's a nice breeze. Even though it was 90 degrees today, there was still a breeze and it wasn't that bad. I sometimes think, boy, it's such a torture to live in paradise before I go to heaven. They say that Florida is heaven's waiting ground. I believe it. This is a time when we can sit at home, sit on our back porch, open God's word, hear the wind blow, watch it rustle in the trees and draw closer to God. That's what we should do. You know, I thought of this verse and I didn't write it down. It says, a man for the punishment of his sins. And I can think of in 1 Kings chapter 17, a a, a widow woman who was out there and she was picking up sticks, getting ready to prepare her last meal like many people may be doing tonight around the world. And Elijah the prophet just so happens to come stumbling upon her because God said, go and seek out that widow woman. And he goes and he seeks her out and he tells her, hey, this is what God said to do she could have said no i don't believe tonight i'm just going to go and eat my last bit of food and i'm just going to go die i'm just going to go lock my door coronavirus is going to get me my whole world's falling apart but she said no man of god i'm going to do what you say because i have faith unfeigned what she said was is i believe god and i'm not afraid you know and then her son does die And the first thing she says to the man of God, what have I to do with thee? Is the Lord going to bring to remembrance all my sins? No, because his mercies are new every day. That's why there's a question mark. Because he's asking, is God allowing me to go through this trouble because of some sin I've done? The answer is no, because you can't pay for your own sins. His mercies are new every morning. To the believer. Verse 40. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Turn again to the Lord. Well, how do you do that? Verse 41. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in heaven. Hey, you know what? There's a lot of fake worship going on in America today. People running into churches with a bunch of jungle music. We're old-fashioned, King James, independent, Bible-believing Baptists, and we don't need a bunch of uh, songs where you just say, holy, holy, as we sway back and forth. As I said before, I put my hope in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. There's a reason why we use the old hymns. There's doctrine in them. So when I lift up my heart to God, I'm not just doing it with lip service or swaying back and forth in in the pew while you dim the lights and blow smoke. And by the way, the smoke blowing out from the stage isn't the only smoke blowing. The preacher's out there blowing smoke as he's wearing his skinny jeans, pointy shoes, and a button-down T-shirt. Don't look like the man of God to me. He blows just as much smoke as the, as, the, as the band does. And so people aren't lifting up their heart. They're just coming in with a public show. And then they walk out and they feel good for a little while. And then reality hits them. And they haven't been fed. And they don't know what God expects from them. And they just feel like they can continue doing the things that they've done continually. And there's no change. I'm not saying... You have to change to get saved. I'm saying once you get saved, you should try to change. Ask God. Change. You don't have to waller in the mire. You don't have to be in. You know, this is, this is like a, uh, um, just a great example. Even though Jeremiah was in the pit and the wormwood and gall, too many Christians are in self-imposed induced pits. Sitting in wormwood and gall. And they're the ones putting themselves there. I I think of the verse uh, down here, uh, verse 34, to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth. 
God doesn't want to crush people that are prisoners and slaves to sin. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Jesus wants to let the captives free. He doesn't want to bond you into religion. He wants to set you free so that you can lift up your heart to God and make a change and draw closer to him and have a relationship. Verse 42, we have transgressed and rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned. Look, the pardon's there for the asking, but you have to ask. You have to ask. You have to go to him and ask. Verse 43, thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us. Thou hast slain and not pitied. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayers should not pass through. Hold your place here and turn turn back in your Bible to the left to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. You know, I want you to live as godly as you can, and there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. It's for your own good. It's for your own good. Verse number six, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Amen. He's a savior waiting for your call. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Not afraid of coronavirus, but afraid of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Oh, fear the Lord. Ye saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? There's a lot of people that are so scared, they don't think they're ever going to see another good day again. They think it's the end of the world, the end of the road, and the end of their life. Your life's over when God says it's over. Not a second sooner, not a second later. You know, when you realize that God can take you out at any second with the fear of the Lord. I'm more free today than I've ever been. More free today than I've ever been. Because I already know that I'm, my body's going to die. And you know what? I have a home in heaven. And in Revelation 19, the Apostle John saw me come back on a white horse behind Jesus. So I know I'm saved. I know I'm going. What do I have to be afraid of? Nothing. And we all want to see good days. Well, how do you do it? Verse 13. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Hey, speak right. People are fighting like never before today. I've never seen anything like it. The things that come out of people's mouths, it blows my mind. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. All their troubles. Holding your place in Lamentations 3, skip to the New Testament to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse number 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Boy, I see a lot of compassion going along today, don't you? You know, 
People run in and grab the last of everything in the grocery store. And they'll grab and they'll just empty the whole thing into their cart because they don't have compassion. Instead of just not worrying and taking just a little, they take everything and they leave. Nothing for anyone else. Because the world's just filled with compassion tonight. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Nobody's courteous. I can't tell you the last time I've tried to hold a door for someone that they've actually said thanks. Normally it's they look at you like you got a third eye popping out of your head. They don't want you anywhere near them. We've lost being courteous and opening the door for each other as a people in general. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. A blessing. When you live right and do the right things, God's going to bless you. He's going to leave you a blessing. Well, here we go again, though. This sounds awfully familiar. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Listen, we need to get some things right in our life tonight. We need to use this book the right way. Turn back to Lamentations chapter number 3. See, Christian... Tonight, there's a lot of people that are probably praying and asking God, but they're not getting these things out of their life that they need to remove. See, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But in verse 44, the Bible says, Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayer should not pass through. How does a prayer get blocked in heaven? You block it. You blocked your prayer. You made a choice when the right thing was put before you and the wrong thing. You decided to do the wrong thing, and then you wonder why God hasn't answered your prayer tonight. I'm just going to try to help you get your prayer answered. There's a cloud that you put there. Remove that cloud. Thou hast redeemed my life, though. Look at verse 47. This speaks of right now. Verse number 47, fear and a snare has come upon us. Desolation and destruction. Boy, if you heard the news and all this, you'd think it was the end of the world and everything's just going to fall apart forever. And so many people, instead of turning to the Lord, are doing verse 48, my eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eye trickleth down and ceaseth ceaseth, ceaseth not without any intermission till the Lord look down and behold from heaven. Look, I understand we're worried about our families. It's okay to shed a tear, right? He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again, rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. It's good to cry. For the sadness of the heart well, the sadness, uh, the sadness of the heart, the countenance is made better, I believe. I may have it backwards, but it's in Ecclesiastes. Look it up on your own time. I understand, I understand that there is a fear. And there are many people crying tonight. But Christian, we shouldn't be. We should be lifting up our heads tonight. Verse 51, my eye affecteth my heart because of all the daughters of my city. My enemies chased me sore like a bird without a cause. Many of us, we were just going by our daily life and this thing's hit and uprooted us. And many of us feel like there was no real reason for it, but it's here nonetheless. They have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast a stone upon me. Waters flowed over my head. Then I said... I am cut off. I called upon thy name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. Thou hast heard my voice. Hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. Thou drawest near in the day that I called upon thee. 
thou saidest, fear not. O Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. In the beginning, I talked about knowing the Lord as your Savior. And I'm going to talk a little bit of that about that right at this point tonight. See, because you have to have a starting point. Salvation isn't what you stop doing. It's not a 10-step program. It's what you start doing. Turn to Revela- uh, Romans chapter 10. I've been reading a lot of Revelation, but Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. In the burden of every pastor, every Sunday school teacher, every soul winning Christian that's out there, everyone who knocks the doors starts in verse number one of Romans chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for all of America and the whole world that they might be saved. Obviously, it's Israel in here because Paul had a burden for his people. Just like we here at Berean Baptist Church not only have a burden for our church members but and how they're doing, but we have a burden for Port Charlotte, Northport, Inglewood, Rotunda, this area. But not just this area. We support more missionaries than any church I've been to and give them more money that they can do more with than anywhere I've ever been. We have a burden not just for America and Israel like Paul did, but for the world. For the world. If you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to consider Berean Baptist Church. If soul winning and missions is important to you, if those things are important to you, this is the place for you. Verse 2, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. I feel like that's a lot of the churches tonight. They have a zeal for God. They want to come in and everybody's happy and they slap each other on the back and joke and everything's great. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They're they're not being led the right way. They're not doing the right things. They're not being taught how to win people to Jesus Christ. I've knocked so many doors where someone will come to the door and they belong to even a Baptist church and yet they've never been told how they can have a home in heaven. Never. Can't tell you how many doors Brother Floyd and I have knocked, or Brother Harry and I, Brother Don, Brother Jan. How many doors have been knocked? How many people say they belong to a church? And you say, well, before before I go, do you know for sure if you died today, you're not banking it on your church membership. You're banking it on your relationship with Jesus Christ, Him paying it all, all to Him I owe. Uh, Is that how you're going to heaven? No. No, I've never heard that before. Wait, you've been in church. You go to church, you're going to be there this Sunday, and you've never heard how you can have a home in heaven. They have a zeal for God. Yeah, they go to church once a week because that's the only time their church is open anymore. But they don't have the knowledge. Why? Verse 3, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. His breastplate of righteousness. And going about to establish their own righteousness. I go to church. I do good. I do good deeds. Good deeds don't redeem your life, your soul. You're never going to do enough good. You can't. Because the scale isn't lining up with the pervert on TV. The scale doesn't line up with the guy that you're better than. Your scale lines up with God. And it'll never line up. Not even close. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that works their way to heaven. No. It's not what it says. For everyone that believeth, believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. You want to keep the law? Pharisee, scribe, Sadducee? Then you'll be twofold more a child of the devil than the people you convert. Someone who tells you you have to keep the law to be saved is a liar. Because there's nothing you can do to keep your salvation. Jesus did it all. All to him I owe. 
But the righteousness which is of the faith, which is of faith, in verse number 6, speaketh on the wise. Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You lift up your hands of your heart in Lamentations chapter 3. He's the Redeemer. You lift up your heart to Jesus Christ. You don't lift up your mind, although there should be a change of one. Because this is what the Bible says in verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You know, that's why we go soul winning. That's why we knock the doors. That's why we support missionaries who give the gospel. Because we want to be preachers that preach the word of God that people get saved. If we're not preaching to where somebody truly, truly believes in their heart and gets saved, and we're just up here beating our gums, and we're just up here slamming the pulpit and getting excited for nothing so we can just sit back and hide in our house. That's no good. That's not profitable. Verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to get the word of God out like never before. I don't know how much time the world has. I don't know how much time America has. I don't know. But we need to put our hand to the plow and start plowing this ground in Port Charlotte, Englewood, and Northport. And now online, we need to plow the ground of the internet. We need people to get saved. I want to get into heaven and I want somebody to have gotten saved because of something that maybe we did and they come up and they congratulate you and hug you in heaven and say because of you, because of that track you put at the gas station, because you knocked my door and I said no I don't want anything to do with the gospel and you stuck that track in my door anyway I'm so glad you did. Do you realize there's not a Christian in the world who's going to say, boy, I sure do regret getting that guy saved? No. See, we can't give God anything but our heart. See, we were born, we brought nothing into this world, and I'm sure we can take nothing out. But your faith in Jesus Christ. You know... <clears throat> I, don't, I know there's a lot of things going on and, and people get fearful and they, they say, oh, I can't wait till this happens and that happens. And, but, you know, the world's relying on a lot of people that it shouldn't. Bill Gates is going to save you. He's going to invent a vaccine. He's going to save you. I got news for you. If there's not money involved, he's not going to try. Amen. I'll tell you why. Because 2.3 million people die of starvation a year. And he's not given any of his Xbox money to save them. And he's not sending them food packages. So don't rely on any one of these worldly people to come up with a solution. You fear not because your life has been redeemed. You were bought with a price. A price. And... If you want to, if, if, you, if, if you're out there in the internet and you message us because you want to know more about Jesus and what he can do for you, please. We have people that can get on there and show you how you can be saved and have a home in heaven. 
And, you know, the way I look at it, the world wants to get rid of people, and I think heaven would be a great place the more the merrier. I want heaven to be packed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to reach our people of this church, Lord, to strengthen them. Lord, encourage them. Help them not to be afraid. Lord, every generation has gone through something. We're always so soon removed when things go our way of the calamities that can always take place without a cause, as your word just said. And at a moment's notice, great devastation and things can happen. But that's not who we are as a people. We have the answers. Lord, strengthen the people of God tonight. Whether they go to our church or not, all the saved tonight, Lord, I ask that you strengthen. My heart's desire is that all the saved people right now in this world unite in prayer, getting the sin out of their life, drawing closer to God so that you can draw closer to us. The Bible says, draw nigh unto you, Lord, and you'll draw nigh unto us. Lord, help us to get these things out of our life and prepare for your return. I don't want to be ashamed at your coming. I want to have arms open wide that you would receive me. Lord, I want to be selfish. I want to be the first one that runs up to you and thanks you for what you've done for me and how you've been merciful when I've never deserved it, how you've saved me, how you've met my needs, how you've met my family's needs, the faith that you've given me, Lord. Lord, I want to be selfish. I want to come up and hug you first. Lord, I just thank you for this church, the opportunity you've given us. And I just ask, Lord, that you be with your people tonight and that you meet with them and touch their hearts and their lives and encourage them and strengthen them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.